Welcome everybody to Cardiovascular Medicine Grand Rounds. It's a great pleasure to me to introduce today's speakers. Um, Dan Maniz is an associate professor in the Cardiovascular Medicine Division at the University of Michigan and has served as the program director of the Interventional Cardiology Fellowship Program for the past 11 years. He received his medical degree from Rush Medical College. He completed his internal medicine residency, cardiology fellowship, an interventional cardiology fellowship at the University of Michigan. In addition to fellow education, his interests include complex and high risk for continuous coronary intervention or CHIP, and he directs the chronic total occlusion or CTO program. Additionally, he is actively involved in the structural program and has both clinical and research interest in percutaneous mitral and tricuspid valve interventions. Brett Wanamaker is an interventional cardiologist and clinical assistant professor at the cardiovascular division at the University of Michigan. He obtained his medical degree uh, as well as internal medicine residency training at John Hopkins University. He completed his cardiology fellowship and interventional cardiology fellowship at the University of Michigan. He also serves as the associate uh, program director at the interventional cardiology fellowship training program. His clinical and research interests include percutaneous therapies to treat patients with chronic total uh, occlusions or other complex coronary disease. And he's also interested in techniques to ensure the quality and durability of percutaneous okay. interventions in these patients. I can personally tell you that these are two of the most thoughtful and smart cardiologists that I've worked with. So I'm very, very excited to, to listen to their presentation. So thank you very much and help me introduce them. Thank you so much, Victor. Um, everybody hear me? Appreciate everyone coming and tuning in. Um, we're gonna be talking about heart team challenges in the era of modern contemporary percutaneous intervention and how we as a field are moving beyond the syntax trial. So the objectives of our talk are to explain the fundamentals of what we call now contemporary PCI and highlight some of the new tools and techniques that have reshaped how we do percutaneous interventions really over the past 15 years. We're gonna detail how the use of adjunctive physiology and then intracoronary imaging have influenced the utility, quality, and safety of percutaneous interventions. And then Dan's gonna review the Michigan PCI experience, including the evolution of our multidisciplinary revascularization consult team. So we'll start with the case presentation. This is a difficult case we faced last winter. A 60 year old gentleman who presented with a week of chest pain. He had a history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and they saw diffuse ECG changes. He also has a history of diabetes and notably a history of ALS, which has been slowly progressive over a period of several years. He could actually still walk with assistance. His high sensitivity troponin at the outside hospital was above 2000 and his echo showed a normal sized LV but with global hypokinesis and EF of 40%. What we see on this angiogram here on the caudal view is that his left main almost looks disarticulated. He has a severe critical distal left main lesion and then very heavily calcified vessels, heavily calcified LED and circumflex. Oh, and by the way, the circumflex is also dominant. So we don't even have a right coronary to rely upon to bail us out for some sort of myocardial perfusion. So this is a very, desperate situation for this gentleman. And so he actually arrived, uh, tr was transferred to our ICU, was having intermittent chest pain and ECG changes and, and an urgent balloon pump was placed. And they gave us uh, a minute to think. And so there was a, a rapid um, heart team conversation that involved our multidisciplinary revascularization team. The patient has very complicated disease, a syntax score of 48, which we consider to be definitely within the high range. His STS mortality was also um, significant at 3.8% for cabbage in terms of his mortality. And being a diabetic and the evidence for <clears throat> bypass in that situation, but also his, um, his unique presentation and his medical history and the concerns given regarding his ability to recover from bypass surgery, we had some key questions regarding his PCI candidacy. So can we technically do PCI in this case, given how diseased his vessels are, given his degree of calcification? And then what is the short and long-term efficacy of PCI 
in his situation? And will he survive the intervention? Does he need human dynamic support? And still, even though it's dated now, we think about the Syntex trial and still one of the most talked about trials in the world of revascularization and interventional cardiology. And so published in 2009, the Syntex trial involved 1,400 patients that were randomized. They had multivessel disease, randomized to either cabbage or PCI. And the PCI group received first-generation taxes, drug-eluting stents. What we saw in that trial, this is just the one-year data, was a marked difference in MACE between PCI and cabbage at one year. 13.5% rate of need for repeat revascularization in the PCI group at one year. That was unstratified data. When we stratified the patients with intermittent or with intermediate and then complex disease, we saw that PCI really struggled with patients who had complex disease. So we have a one year MACE rate of 23.4% in the most complicated patients. In the syntax PCI group, only 57% of the patients in the PCI arm were able to receive complete revascularization. We know that the MACE rates were higher for those who, were, who had residual unrevascularized un disease. But this was essentially state-of-the-art PCI in the early 2000s. So this trial was published in 2009, but enrollment really began in 2005. And so I, I won't tell you what I was doing in 2005, but I was not in college yet. So we've had an evolution toward what we call contemporary PCI, and that's been multifaceted. So there's been an evolution in tools and techniques changes in the way that we think about what vessels can be treated and then the most effective way to treat them. We have new tools and then a mastery of older tools with atherectomy and lithotripsy and then techniques in dealing with more difficult lesions that are chronic total occlusions, left main, bifurcation lesions. There's been standardization and perfection of techniques to deal with those. We've changed the way we understand what lesions should be treated through physiologic evaluation and assessment with various indices. And then we've completely revolutionized how we think about procedural success, quality, and durability. And that's mainly come through intravascular imaging with IVIS and OCT. Tools have evolved and continue to evolve. So calcium really, when we think about it, is the arch enemy of a successful percutaneous procedure. In the right panel here, we see an attempted balloon angioplasty in a very calcified lesion. You see that the balloon is essentially what we call dog boning. It can't fully expand in that lesion. This is a dangerous situation because the angioplasty is not going to be successful. And there's actually a significant risk as this balloon tries to dilate. It's putting more pressure on the non-calcified sections of the vessel. And there's a risk of dissection. There's a risk of perforation. And there's a huge risk of failure if, this, if we go ahead and stent this incompletely prepared vessel. We know that patients who undergo PCI who have a heavy calcium burden do worse in general for a variety of, of factors, but really calcium poses the biggest threat to the efficacy and safety of PCI. And this has become an increasingly common issue in the statin era as we treat older patients, patients that are higher risk with more heavily calcified and diffuse disease. So, the left panel is a picture we hope to never see. This is a, a lesion that was stented without complete preparation. We see the stent is totally collapsed in this calcified lesion. It's not expanded at all. It's a very small luminal area inside that stent. And that is a huge risk for stent failure, both in terms of something catastrophic with stent thrombosis, but also in the, the moderate term, um, in stent restenosis. And so this IBIS picture on the right demonstrates the impact of calcium. This is a stented segment. You can't see the stent quite well, but you see that there's a nodule of calcium in the bottom right quadrant that's impacting the stented area and the stent conformation to the vessel wall. And so we've dealt with this increasingly through atherectomy. And this is actually a technology that's been around for a while, but has actually increased in use due to our ability to manage it safely and effectively and sort of a paradigm shift in how we think about its use. The most common device that we use is this rota burr right here, which has, which is a diamond coated burr that ablates the inelastic calcium while bouncing off of the softer non-diseased vessel walls through differential cutting. 
We also have an orbital atherectomy device, which kind of orbits around the vessel. And again, through differential cutting, ablates and modifies the surface of the calcified lesions. Atherectomy was traditionally thought of as a, a technology that we, we wanted to use to ablate as much tissue as possible. We wanted to get the biggest lumen possible to remove as much plaque as possible. And now we approach it a little bit differently. All we want to do now is to modify the vessel such that we can perform an effective angioplasty, expand that vessel for stenting, and not necessarily uh, go with the maximum amount of ablation where we would have a risk of you know, reflow or periprocedural MI, et cetera. And so the panel on the left shows an atherectomy burr making its way down the LED. And on the right here, we see an OCT image of a vessel after atherectomy. So this vessel is actually quite large. It's almost the entire image here. And the atherectomy burr has just modified a small portion of it. But that's really all we need to deliver a balloon to perform other adjunctive treatments like lithotripsy, et cetera. We're not looking to ablate the entirety of the plaque tissue in this vessel anymore. And so atherectomy use has increased. And this is actually data from the state's quality consortium. Um, it's now uh, a little bit older, up to 2017. And we see that it was steadily increasing, but really as orbital atherectomy came onto the scene, it's increased quite a bit throughout the, the late 2000s. So overall, there's been a trend toward increase in atherectomy use in the past 10 years. And some of that's been guided by our understanding of what needs atherectomy and the use of intracoronary imaging to identify calcium that's going to be a problem. So now at U of M, at least this year in 2023, up to 10% of cases have involved an atherectomy device. And that in some ways reflects the way that we approach these vessels, but also the complexity of the patients and the disease that we're seeing in our cath lab. Probably the biggest major breakthrough in our ability to treat heavily calcified vessels over the past several years has been the approval of intracoronary lithotripsy, um, also known as the shockwave device. And this is a balloon that opposes the vessel walls and then has two emitters that are going to basically use an electrical impulse to generate a shockwave that's then going to modify both superficial and deep calcium in the, in the vessel. And so through a variety of, of mechanisms from both the incident shockwave as well as its reflection and then cavitation, which we see here, it can crack and modify the calcium and allow for adequate balloon expansion and stenting of the vessel. So this is an OCT image of a heavily calcified, circumferentially calcified vessel, uh, pretty limited luminal area. And this is what it looks like after lithotripsy, where we have these deep fissures in the calcium and the calcified plaque that then permit stenting of the vessel. And this is a nice circumferential stent with a very generous luminal area that is really an effective and long lasting procedure we think for the patient. And so this is something that has really been integrated pretty frequently into our algorithm for dealing with calcium. And so you can see as it came into approval in 2021 and then to 2022, there's been a huge increase and this year so far, 13% of our PCI cases have involved some form of lithotripsy. Besides calcium modification, there have been changes that have occurred since Syntax and our drug-eluting stent platforms, actually quite a bit of change. And we're now onto the third generation of drug-eluting stents. So the Taxis, or the Syntax study used first-generation Taxis stents that emitted paclitaxel. Um, and these were characterized by thicker stent struts and then a relatively thick durable polymer that the stents were coated in that then eluded the drug. And the modern stent platforms, the contemporary stent platforms use thin and then in some cases an ultra thin strut platform. And then the polymer itself that's on the stent is much less bulky. And in many cases it's bioresorbable. So it doesn't hang around as long. And so what that means is that we have a lower rate of instant restenosis, but a markedly lower risk of instant thrombosis. So all the problems that we saw with stent thrombosis in the first generation of drug-eluting stents are no longer an issue with um, the third generation of drug-eluting stents. In fact, all the contemporary drug-eluting stent platforms that we use are now labeled for one month of dual antibiotic therapy in patients who have a really high bleeding risk. Um, and that's something that would never have been 
thought possible with the first generation of these devices. There's also been an evolution in some of the techniques that we use in terms of the vessels that we think we can treat. Um, this is a picture of Andreas Grunzig who invented PCI in 1975. And it's one of my favorite pictures because he's actually, he has, has a poster at AHA and he's explaining to people what he's invented. You can see the excitement in his eyes. And he was an innovator who recognized that even though what he had done was uh, really on the frontier, that there would be a huge amount of advancement required to treat the most complex patients and the most complex lesions. And nowhere is that more exemplified than in the treatment of chronic total occlusions, which have really been the biggest challenge for the field and the biggest sort of evolution over the past 10 to 15 years. So in syntax, 269 of the patients who were randomized to PCI had CTOs and a handful of them were not attempted, but of those that were attempted, the success rate was below 50%. And these are really challenging lesions. This is a, a right coronary that is completely occluded. And we're only seeing the distal vessel fill as we inject the left coronary and then collaterals fill that distal vessel. So we know that it's there, but there's a lot of challenges. The vessel path can be ambiguous. Um, the cap or beginning of the CTO is tough fibrous calcified, and often there's prior bypass anatomy in the way, and really only 50% of them can just be wired sort of in a traditional manner. And so there's been an ongoing evolution of safety and, and efficacy in terms of how to deal with these through different techniques. One of the techniques that we often have to employ, probably about a quarter of a cases, a quarter of cases, is intentionally dissecting around the occluded segment and then using a dedicated device to then re-enter into the true lumen of the vessels. It's a little bit difficult to appreciate here, but this wire is actually intentionally directed submittingly around the occlusion. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna pick a spot to redirect the wire back into the healthy portion of the true lumen of the vessel. And then we stent across the occlusion and that including the subintimal area, and then that entire area will endothelialize in a period of months. We also have now the wire technology and the techniques to use a retrograde pathway to recanalize chronic total occlusion. So this is a patient who has a very proximal right coronary total occlusion. There was a bypass graft that went to this right coronary, but that's now diseased and no longer functioning. Now it's very difficult for us to get through the front way to penetrate this occlusion. But what we can do is we can utilize the bypass graft as a retrograde conduit direct our equipment down the old bypass graft, then back around backwards, retrograde up the right coronary, and then utilize a retrograde technique, often crossing is a bit easier from behind and recanalize the vessel. And so here's a reconstructed right coronary and actually we're filling that bypass graft that's no longer functional with our injections. One of the other things that's changed significantly in terms of how we approach lesions and where, what lesions we need to treat and where is our understanding of physiology. And so the assessment of borderline lesions with physiology, whether that be FFR or a resting indice, index is, is, um, is now routine. This top left panel is the, uh, the event curves for the FAME2 trial, which tested um, PCI versus medical therapy in patients who had a significant FFR value of 0.8 or less. And what we saw in that trial was that deferring lesions that had an FFR value greater than 0.8, those patients did just fine. Whereas in the patients who did have a significant FFR, offering PCI had a lower event rate than medical therapy out to one year, primarily in terms of need for urgent revascularization. But we really like um, using physiology, especially with FFR, um, because it takes into account the amount of myocardium that's subtended by a vessel and also the length of the stenosis. We're not just kind of guesstimating, you know, oh, that looks like a 70% lesion. We know that that's ischemic based on a physiologic index. And if we look at more modern PCI trials like Syntex 2 or FAME 3, 25% of the lesions that people thought needed treatment ended up being non-significant by one of the um, physiologic studies. So it leads us to defer PCI in lesions that um, the patient won't benefit. And so FFR 
with adenosine, a hyperemic index is kind of the OG here. And then it's given rise though to non-hyperemic measures, which don't utilize adenosine. Um, they look at a very narrow period during diastole where coronary resistance is thought to be quite low and can provide us with a resting non-hyperemic index. And so that's particularly useful. Uh, that's particularly useful because a non-hyperemic index allows us to assess different parts of the vessel, all as part of the same assessment, whereas FFR, different lesions will influence the FFR value of other lesions, and so we can't do that. But with a resting index, we can actually do a pullback across the vessel to understand the zone that we plan to treat and what impact that might have on the pressure gradient across the vessel. So here's a patient here that has what looks like probably a significant mid-LED lesion. Um, a pressure wire is placed to the distal vessel. We find that there is a significant pressure drop. So the patient does plausibly have distal LED ischemia. But when, and this is an example of, of um, an IFR pullback that's been co-registered to the vessel, each one of these dots corresponds to a 0 0.01 drop in the IFR number. What we see is that though there is a bit of a drop here at the lesion that we thought was significant, there's actually a gradual and consistent drop across the mid to distal LED, indicating that there might be an element of diffuse disease there. So we can kind of use that to understand where our plan treatment, how our plan treatment is going to impact the patient's physiology. And then in certain cases where there's a significant amount of diffuse disease, we then say, you know, perhaps PCI is not going to be a benefit here in relieving ischemia, and this is best treat with, treated with medical therapy or with bypass. Yeah, trying to, there we go. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's just rearing its, love it. Thank you. All right. Probably the biggest um, revolution that's occurred in the, the past several years, especially, in the percutaneous intervention space has been the use of intracoronary imaging. And really, IVIS or OCT are becoming standard of care. So on top, we have an example of optical um, coherence tomography and then intravascular ultrasound on the bottom, both the cross-sectional and then longitudinal views of the vessel. And so this is incredibly useful for us to identify the characteristics of coronary plaque and plan interventions and also diagnose complications, dissection, hematoma, to identify an area of plaque rupture and then assess vessel size when we're planning our procedure. And so this is really something that's been around since the late nineties at least, but uptake was very slow. And some of the barriers were that the councils were not as easy to use. A lot of it was operator familiarity. And then frankly, time and cost were a big issue throughout the interventional cardiology community. But now we have mounting evidence for clinical benefit, especially in the most complex cases, which Dan is going to talk a little bit about. And so what intracoronary imaging has done for us is it's completely redefined how we consider uh, the success and quality of a PCI. So before we would do a stent procedure and take a look at it and say, well, that stent looks well expanded, um, doesn't seem to be any complications, um, think it looks pretty good. But now we actually have things that we can look at and a standardization for optimal PCI based on imaging criteria. How well is the stent expanded relative to the reference vessel? And have we ruled out in real time complications such as a stent edge dissection, hematoma, or other issue? So we no longer have to guess and we no longer have to eyeball the success of our procedures. Here on the left side, we see an example of a complication after PCI, which is uh, an edge dissection, hematoma. So the intima of the vessel is actually peeled away from the rest of the vessel structure. And so that's something that's gonna require treatment and that we could easily identify. Here in the bottom panel, we see a stent that looks okay, but actually the vessel diameter is much larger. So this stent was significantly undersized and underexpanded. And so this is also an essential tool for us to uncover the mechanism of failure of prior PCI procedures that we might see. And this is what gives us the confidence to discharge patients on the same day for routine procedures. And then also the confidence to recommend a shorter period of depth, because we know there's no complications. We know that the stent has been fully optimized to the vessel. 
And we know that angiograms lie. And this was one of my cases. Um, this was the patient's index PCI, 74 year old. She had a mid LED lesion and this is after stenting. And I thought it looked pretty good. This was back in 2020. And I didn't uh, use intravascular imaging in this case. I just thought it looked good. And she came back seven months later with a significant amount of chest pain. It's a little bit difficult to appreciate here. I'll show you the still frame in a second, but she's gonna have instant restenosis right here in her middle LED. So the arrow marks the area of concern. Um, it's having lots of angina, markedly positive PET scan. And what we saw on IVIS was that the index stent procedure was never adequate. This is a underexpanded stent inside a densely calcific lesion with a very small minimal luminal area. So it's not really a surprise that she came back with stent failure and instant restenosis. And so we have ways to treat this and deal with this, but the whole point is to keep this from ever having happened during the index procedure. And so that's been sort of a whirlwind summary, but there's been a paradigm shift toward contemporary PCI, whereas traditional PCI was using mainly just balloons and stents, stent minimalism, because there was a risk of thrombosis and complications, complex lesions that were left untreated, and then eyeballing things and saying, oh, the stents look pretty good. Now we have a widespread use of advanced calcium modification techniques, third generation drug eluting stent platforms, bifurcation, CTO techniques. We use physiology to guide treatment. And then we use intravascular imaging to make sure that our treatment is fully optimized for the patient. But what does this mean in practice? What are the actual results? And then how do we move beyond thinking about the results in a syntax sort of framework? And what does that mean for what we do here at Michigan? And that's what Dan's gonna talk about now. You guys hear me all right? Great. Thanks, Brett. That was a great, um, great lead in to, um, to kind of some of the stuff that I'd like to talk about. Victor, appreciate the opportunity to talk today and appreciate the, the kind words. And, um, and so um, I'll kind of pick it up with, from, from where Brett uh, started and, you know, we'll talk a little bit. There'll be some a little bit of overlap of, um, you know, what Brett had talked about. Um, but from my perspective, it was really a way to step back. I thought he actually had the fun part. He gets to show pretty pictures and show all the cool tools, but I really wanted to step back and kind of give it a little bit more of a programmatic feel, kind of a think or a thought or a reflection about kind of how things have changed. And um, Brett doesn't recall where he was when Syntax was released, but I do because I was training. So I was here, I was training, and I was young attending. Um, it's just another way that he can remind me uh, how old I am uh, and, uh, and, and um, always remind me of his youthful endeavor. But, um, but in, that in that regard, though, it, it really, when I started thinking about syntax and kind of where we've gone you know, from there is a lot of it, you know, to me, was a reflection of my career. And so I did start, this was me, um, the syntax trial was, was what I was trained to do. This is what I learned to do. This is how I, I, I did my work from day to day. And so um, without really thinking about how that's changed over the last decade, and a lot of the things that Brett talked about today are the things that kind of molded me and really changed and really defined my career in many ways. And so, again, I don't want to overlap too much with what Brett said, but, you know, as we think about it, you know, he showed the, the results. But, you know, what was the syntax trial? It was really designed to really pit, as, as always, as interventionists, we love to do, we pit our stents, our whiz good surgeons, right? That was that kind of has always been, and I think somewhere in our genetics, you know, that we wanted to say we could do, or we could beat bypass, we can equal bypass. And that's not really what was shown, obviously. And syntax court and syntax trial really didn't do that. But what it, what, it, what it has done, while the, the, the results are really outdated at this point, no, you know, stents did not necessarily beat surgery in that situation. But what it did do is it created a nomenclature or a shared uh, conversation. We created a scoring tool that really allows us to compare patients and to understand outcome data and to really serve as a way to uh, understand how we can talk to patients. How can we talk to each other? How do we talk to our surgeons? And so that's still uh, present today. We will, you will still see us refer to the syntax score, and that's something that we'll continue to use. So it really has been an important piece of, of, of uh, data that we continue to look back at uh, and continue to use. And so 
uh, it's important to remember, it's really just an anatomic scoring a data set. It's not, doesn't take into other patient account, other factors and, and clinical issues. So um, it really though, to this day is really used just to, to kind of use as a, as a um, kind of a scoring system. So this was me, this is an actual picture of me as a fellow. Um, that's in, in an early attending, that's all I had. And, you know, basically hammer and, and the nail and that, that was about it. And, um, you know, back then I didn't know or we didn't think we were in the Stone Ages. We had drug looting stents. We thought that was going to change the game. And it did, you know, for a lot of, for a large portion, uh, drug looting stents were game changers. But I will tell you that at the time and looking back and reflecting, I think we were so focused on that technological advance because all we really wanted to do was the arch enemy for us at that time. Yeah, calcium was a problem, but we didn't even think about the calcium was re -stenosis. So all our patients, or many of our patients, I should say, were often coming back and we were constantly dealing with re -stenosis. And as, general, as drug looting sense knew at the time, and yes, I remember time before that, uh, you know, this was, you know, really bit, pretty much a game changer. So, um, so at the time, this was felt to be you know, really, you know, what uh, we thought we had, you know, we thought this is, this was, this was okay. I didn't realize we we're in the stone ages at the time. I did try to find some pictures of my mentors, like a Tinder and Stan and Mike, but, but that was, it didn't go back that far. So, sorry, I couldn't find any data to suggest that. And so, um, so syntax two, so I kind of going to jump across is, you know, Brett, did a masterful job of kind of showing you, you know, the things that we do and how we think. And, and, and over the course of about a decade, you know, in addition to seeing our stents and our, our technology improve, you know, there was certainly another current of what can we do better? How can we do better? You know, for, for, for a long time, again, as, as we look to drug looting stents as, as really being the game changer, it was really about just can you get the stent there? Because once you got the stent there, you were fine. The reality is that's probably not true. And, and if you really looked at the, the outcome data and you looked at that additional data from Syntax 1, we were still failing our patients a good percentage of the time. Doing better than we were with the bare metal stents, but we were still failing our patients a lot of times. So now you can see we've moved on. We're at Syntax 2. We're 10 years down the road. We now have fire. We don't just have our, our stick and our hammer, but we actually have more tools. And so really this was a, a trial design to look at what are we doing? Are we doing better? We have better stents, we have better techniques and all of the things that again, Brett kind of showed us. We have now physiologic graded F, uh, PCI. We're not just using the angiography as Brett says, angiography lies. So we have physiology to help us, tell us determine, you know, what lesions need to be treated, where do we need to treat? Um, and so that was mandated really by this trial that used physiology to identify the lesions that need to be treated, use IVIS to optimize the stent once you made that decision. We had the next generation and newest generation of stents, which had actually improved quite a bit. The struts were thinner, there were bioabsorbable polymers, again, everything that Brett had already shown. And probably, again, very significant was there was a higher degree of revascularization or complete revascularization. The, the CTO success rates went from what was, again, relatively normal at that time, which was slightly around 50% or slightly less. I hear it's 53, but Variously, various data suggesting were around 50% of the time they were successful. And I can tell you that the complexity of the CTOs and the type of CTOs that were even attempted were, were much more complex. And we saw what was high volume operators and other contemporaries at that time were getting close to 90% success rates. So with that in mind, this Syntax 2 trial showed us, oh, sorry, I was looking at the wrong one, but this is, uh, this is, you know, this is everything that, that really shows us the, the changes. And this is what the contemporary strategies of the Syntax 2 trial really was and, and really designed as a comparator trial, not a randomized control trial, it's an open, open label trial, but it was really a, a comparator to see really what does PCI now with all these other things that we think are going to be helpful, how is that going to help us and what's that going to look like? And so as we look here, um, you know, we see a, a, a significant trend in improvement in, in outcomes from our patients. And again, this is just looking and comparing against the historical data. You see a significant improvement, and this is out to, to three years of how much uh, improvement in not just re-stent in, in target vessel failure or stent failure, but also in some clinical outcomes, particularly myocardial infarction related to that vessel and need for repeat revascularization. So we start to see that there's really some clinical um, you know, clinical benefits beyond just re -synosis. And so I think that this was uh, really showed what the possibility 
to uh, contemporary PCI and how much better we can do. And it was more about just turning our eye away from improving or waiting for a better stent or better technology, but also thinking about maybe there's better techniques, better ways that we can do our job and better ways that we can do and serve our patients. Now, this was not to say, you know, hey, now look at us, this event rate's better. This is not a comparison to surgery. This didn't change what the original syntax trials said to do. It didn't say, okay, now we can stent more patients instead of going to surgery. You know, this was not a comparator. It was not a head-to-head. -head, it was not a randomized control trial. It wasn't really designed to do that. We have to account for the fact that surgery and techniques have probably improved across that time too. But it was really just about a reflection of our own ability to do things better and to give our patients better, uh, better outcomes. And so, um, you know, as we think about, you know, the Syntax 2, as I mentioned, it really reflected what we think are meaningful improvements and combining really best practices of how to treat, when to treat, uh, and how to assess you know, the results of our treatment. The Syntax score still remains a valuable tool. You'll continue to see us use that. And it really is, again, helps us understand and serve as a signpost for what really the complexity of disease is that we're treating. Uh, and allows us to really kind of identify and discuss with our patients how we should treat them. And so again, as I mentioned, this really wasn't a, a version of a stents versus bypass, but really an idea of um, really what can we do better in the cath lab. And so as we reflect about, you know, and, and looked at, at, at our data and looked at, you know, the things that we were doing here, we certainly, you know, wanted to think, you know, what is it, in, you know, that, that we can do better? And I think that, you know, one of the things, whether we implicitly say it or not, you know, the cath lab here, has always really had the the in its DNA the idea that you know it, we really want to be a center of excellence. We want to be able to provide the best of clinical care as a tertiary referral center, and we want to be that for the patients, our most complicated patients. And in, in that, we've always been uh, really dedicated to the process of quality improvement. We've been leading, uh, we've had Hitinder and, and DeVraj have really been, you know, really instrumental in quality improvement in the BMC Square database that, that they essentially run, you know, throughout the state. It's a quality improvement base. Stan and Mike has similarly in the TAVR program. So we were in the, in the in TAVR and Mitchell program and our structural heart program. So really been as a in part of our DNA, a real, you know, uh, focus on, quality improvement and, 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 and committed to that process. And so uh, we also take our, our jobs as, uh, you know, leaders and, and, and trainees and, and, and how we affect, you know, the, the way that, that we're training the next generation of, of cardiologists. And so we really try to put our best foot forward and think about, you know, what are those things that we can do? And so for me personally, um, this meant kind of thinking a little bit about you know, are we able to be all things, all patients, you know, that we serve, you know, do we have the capability, do we have the abilities to do what we wanted to do, which was really try to mimic and, and, and do whatever the best of the interventions were at that time. And so, you know, if you look again, we talked a little bit and Brett talked about the complete revascularization of the CTO programs uh, and the CTO success rates in the syntax trial. You know, that was really for me a jumping off point to really think about, you know, can we do that here? Can we can we mimic the success that, that places have elsewhere? And so this isn't designed or this talk to be on the scope is to really not talk about, you know, the um, the data behind CTOs. But 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 the CTO program really represented for me a real kind of change in the growth you know, in my practice. And I think something that's impacted, you know, our our cath lab as a whole. Um, CTOs are present and they are common, and we see them and we kind of stumble upon them often. Uh, but you know, at least historically, in the back of the syntax, you know, one era, you know, only about four percent were even being attempted, and that was the number one reason why most patients were being referred to surgery. And so, as you know, steam started to gain around uh, CTO and CTO intervention, you know, we really started to see kind of a transformation in how we thought about these patients. You know, there was a lot of uh, technologic advances that really led to the idea that instead of historically thinking about these kind of lesions as highly complex with low technical success rates and high complications, that these are things that potentially we could take on in a safer and more reliable manner. And so with these dedicated technologies, uh, strategic algorithms, really, again, specialized training with de dedicated operators would really help improve the safety and procedural success. Now, like most things in intervention, you know, data is difficult to come by, and, and CTO has, has been particularly a challenging uh, field to get, you know, really hard and sound evidence. We are, certainly have an accumulation of a lot of observational data, 
uh, in registry studies have showed, again, repeated improvements in technical success. We have a lot of data that supports the improvement in quality of life, but really challenging to really get those kind of hard endpoints that a lot of times we're looking for uh, when thinking about, you know, these kind of more complicated and complex uh, patient uh, patients. So, um, you know, with all that in mind, as we started thinking about, you know, what we wanted from the cath lab and who we wanted to be, you know, we really recognized that there was still a significant need, an unmet clinical need for a lot of our patients who were still having symptoms of site optimal medical therapy, were having a high range of, of ischemic burden. And so with the development uh, of, uh, again, algorithms and, and really a systematic approach and specialized training, uh, we were able to, to be able to start a program now actually uh, now I realize that I was in 2014, so time flies um, when you're stuck in the cath lab for hours. And uh, we start to set that get to show that we can do things like we're you know able to do that, like Brett had shown what I show at the bottom right. And so, um, you know, for us, you know, for for me personally, the journey uh, was uh, uh, was challenging, and it could only be possible really by working in a place where we were all kind of dedicated to the same thing required really, you know, to be able to do CTO PCI and to do it well. It's a resource intense uh, thing to, 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 uh, to take on. It does require buy-in leadership and support from the colleagues were, were critical and something that I had and have continued to have um, really uh, uh, throughout uh, our, our development of that program. And, um, you know, it, it, we've seen that we've had continued procedural growth. Um, we continue to develop skills. Um, and it's just been a real, uh, a real, uh, you know, it's been a real journey to really think about how we've grown and how the cath lab's grown because it hasn't, what I didn't understand and what I didn't recognize at the time was really how the CTO uh, lessons that we learned and the techniques and the, and the, and the challenges that we've been forced to overcome really were just part of a bigger picture of treating these more complicated and complex patients. So oftentimes what we've done is we find that we are, we're really taking the same principles taking the same kind of things and challenges that we're using and applying to the CTO population, but really directing them towards our most complicated patients, often whom that don't have CTOs per se, but also would benefit from, um, uh, from the techniques that we've learned. And so for me, that was a real journey. And, and really it's, it's been less about the CTO uh, portion, which is just one population or one small, small, small subsegment of the patients that we're treating overall. And so, um, with that in mind, in, in thinking about how else we wanted to be, you know, a program that can treat all our patients and treat them to the best of our ability, we really started looking at our own data and looking at our own quality improvement and looking at what was being presented. And we talked about, you know, the improvements and the really kind of the dedication needed to really get the best of our uh, outcomes. And so intracardiology imaging became a real uh, kind of, I think, as Brett would call it, a revolution. And, it, and for us, it was really a revolution as well, because it's not something that we were doing routinely. And as I look back at our own data, you know, this is not something, and I was part of that, you know, I agree with Brett, you know, the intracardiogram lied, you'd say, well, it looks good enough. And we thought that was good enough. And so, um, you know, I think that for a lot of us, uh, you know, initially, we weren't doing a lot of intracorneal imaging. There's a, you know, certainly a plethora of data out there to suggest the benefits. But really, for most of us, you know, we think it's a problem that other people have, that our set technique's really good, and I'm really good at putting my stent in, and I expand it better than everybody else. But really, until you start to look and really start to think about what you're doing uh, in a different way, uh, it's really hard for a lot of us to accept. So we are kind of creatures of habit. But but And I think that's what makes our story here, I think, really uh, I think for, for me, a little more remarkable because we really did look at, you know, the data that was being presented and the accumulation of the data suggesting that we can do better. And so if you look, you know, for us, you know, we saw that our IVC use were consistently less, you know, in the single digits. And again, we started to really think about maybe just only certain subsets where we thought really it was essential. Uh, and, and, and so we really had to take a look at the data. And as we saw in the Syntax trial, part of that was really, or Syntax 2 trial, really saw about part of the successes that they had and the improvements and outcomes really had to do with a lot of routine IVIS data. And as we looked at, you know, kind of the, the emerging data that came on, um, you know, we started to realize that if you look at a lot of the randomized control data, there's really a, a plethora of data that starts to come out and really starts to show that we can start to impact, you know, almost always, if you image as a routine operator, you're gonna see an improvement in, um, uh, in outcomes. And I think initially we we're really focused almost in, entirely again on this idea of restenosis. Uh, and, and really the ultimate trials, one of the, again, one of the larger randomized control trials showed again, sure, 
improve target vessel failure, meaning that our stents are be doing better, our patients are doing better. But what we start to realize is we can't just solve every problem with another drug eluding stent. And that if we start to look a little bit harder at how we're going to implant these stents, way we're going to optimize these stents, we're going to upstream be able to figure out how to best uh, treat our patients and not create just yet another problem that we have to deal with downstream. And so between the ultimate trial and the IVIS uh, XPL trial, again, the, some of the largest data out there, um, not only do we start to see that, you know, yes, our patients are doing better because their stents are lasting longer or they're better at efficacy, but we're also starting to start to see the emergence of improvement in clinical benefit, hard clinical endpoints. And I think that's just far too hard for us to, 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 to ignore. And so as we as a group got together and decided, should we be doing more? Can we ignore this data? Is this something that we need to do? And I know it doesn't seem like much maybe to a non-interventionalist, but this reflects our own personal journey and our data. And you can see that we started at less than just in, you know, kind of, I guess, pre-COVID or in the COVID era, you know, less than 10% single digits, really kind of selective use of IVIS, now almost doing it routinely, almost about 80% of the time. And so well, this is a commitment, again, this is not a, a me or a Brett, but this is really the cath lab as a whole, deciding that this is something that we can do. And if you look at, you know, all the data that that's certainly being published and that's out there looking at state and, 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 and nationwide uh, imaging, you know, we still see it hovering around that 50 or less than 50% or less than half the time. And so, you know, we've really made a committed effort to really put our step, our, our best foot forward to help try to treat our patients in the best way we, we, we know how. So this was a real, I think, tangible uh, view of how we can change things and, and you know, what we can do uh, here at Michigan to be, uh, to kind of lead the way in, in what we think is the right thing to do for, for our patients. And with that in mind, you know, we also, uh, you know, started thinking, okay, well, we have a, you know, a CTO program, we're taking on complicated patients, we have the complex uh, patient uh, subset that we're able to treat, we have the tools to be able to do that, we're doing a better job, we think, we use physiology routinely, I haven't had to show data, because we've always been believers, we've had F FFR and, and, uh, and our resting indices, so we use, F we use our physiologic data uh, routinely, you'll see that in our reports often. And now we're we're really, you know, I think doing everything we can as we do imaging and and showing really a dedication to improve our outcomes. And we we really looked at at how we were delivering what we think is really excellent care to our patients uh, and to our sh our shareholders. And so, um, you know, one thing that we recognized was uh, that we probably weren't delivering the best care or didn't feel as though we felt like we could be delivering better care to a lot of our, our inpatients. And so uh, about a year and a half ago, you know, uh, we decided that, that we could do a better job and we really created this uh, multidisciplinary inpatient revascularization heart team. Uh, you know, prior to that, you know, really the default for a lot of the patients that were coming in, often the most sickest and complex patients, uh, were to consult our surgeons. Surgeons uh, would come, uh, you know, render an opinion, maybe ask you for a few tests. Um, but really, we were not being involved and we were not a part of that conversation. And unfortunately, if we were a part of that conversation, because we really didn't have a, a process by which we could be involved, it was usually either curbside or for me personally, it seemed to always be on a Friday at five o'clock, only after the heart, the patient has been decided that they weren't eligible for surgery. And so now you have a patient who uh, maybe, again, maybe the sickest, most complex patient, but all of a sudden needs stents as a quote-unquote default. There hasn't been a real quality uh, conversation with the patient. We haven't done a really good job of discussing kind of those risks. And so we felt like these were patients that were vulnerable uh, and, uh, and represented, you know, an opportunity to improve the care that we were delivering for these patients. And so um, we really set out to see if there's something that we could do uh, in, in a better uh, path. And so, you know, our goal as we sat down and tried to develop this was to really see what we could do to prevent, you know, future safety events and really try to overall improve the care that we were delivering to our patients. And so a lot of that, uh, you know, we were building on kind of the trust and the relationships that we've had and we've had had with our surgeons already. We've already had, you know, similar areas of success. We could look to the, the successes in the programs or the, the structural programs, which routinely used their relationships with the surgeons to be able to think about how better to deliver that care. And so as we started to do that, we, we, we sat down with our surgeons to try to keep, to think about how can we do this? How can we better uh, communicate a plan? How can we better come up with a plan? And so, 
you know, one of the things that probably the biggest thing we did is we created this program. We really created the idea that we're going to create a parallel path program so that we are more involved as interventionalists upstream. And what we felt, what we felt would, we'd hope to do is a create a little more of a bit of an efficient process, um, maybe allow adequate time and planning for us rather than the, the last minute five, Friday at five o'clock procedure. Um, and maybe have a little bit better communication uh, across the board. And, and so for um, those of you not familiar yet with the procedure, with the process, you know, as for patients that have identified as complex coronary disease, typically patients have been transferred in for a clinical cabbage eval. What we've asked is that, you know, we create one order, creates a parallel path, goes to our CT surgery colleagues, and then the inpatient, our interventional cardiology team. And usually we're, we split it up per week. We're all involved. And we really uh, try to create this multidisciplinary discussion up front. We do this again on the outpatient, but we really haven't found that doing this as an inpatient was really feasible on an ad hoc uh, uh, process. So we really needed a process by which we could do this and solve a lot of these decisions. And so a lot of times now what we like to see is we have a parallel process. We evaluate the patient independently. We look at certain risk factors like STS score and syntax uh, scores. And we try to at least codify for us what the risks are for the patient. We talk to our surgery colleagues, come up with the, most of the time a, a generally unified plan, um, and then come and talk and, and, and review that plan with the patient and give them their options. We do have a contingency plan for what happens if we have different recommendations. Actually haven't had to use that yet, so we got more times than not will agree. Um, and for a lot of folks, there's a lot of equipoise so that you know really the patient gets that and be a part of that decision-making process. And so, you know, it's, it's been actually a really short journey. We looked at the data more recently. We were about a year and a half data, but we've already, you know, evaluated over 200 patients in about a year and a half. Um, we don't have a complete set of the data, but as we try to look at everything that we've done, we see the distribution of patients that tend to be, you know, roughly half and half between kind of your unstable ACS type patient and your stable coronary disease. And probably the thing that I'm one of the things I'm probably most I was most impressed with and, and maybe more proud of is that you know we at least felt we were able to provide a clear uh, express plan for our patients within about two days in the vast majority of patients and for us that that really um, may have not impacted length of stay or um, the care that was being delivered but I think it really helps uh, and I hope uh, it helps you know uh, from an inpatient perspective. I know it helps us in really kind of helping figure out what these patients do and, and where they're going to go. And having a defined plan, I think, has been really, really remarkable. And I know for our part, it has really helped with communication across the board. And so we just like to take a look and see if we look at our patients, who are we treating? How are we treating them? Uh, when I look at our data, we, we, do, we stratify them by our, the SDS risk and the syntax score. Again, these are, these are data that we can use objectively to kind of assess what our patients are doing. And if you see, you know, look at our SDS score, uh, scoring system, our, our most vulnerable patients, our highest risk patients, they're, prim they're primarily getting treated with PCI. This seems like a reasonable approach uh, for our patients, but those with the most complex uh, com complex coronary disease as defined by our syntax score, those patients were less likely having cabbage. So I think it really reflects, I think, a, a really good partnership with our surgeons that we're really uh, looking at treating our own patients. It's not exclusive, and these are individual, you know, decisions made on a day-to-day -day basis, but um, it really kind of shows the distribution and, and how we are approaching our patients uh, in what I think is, is really an appropriate way. And so, you know, for us, you know, you know, we're trying to collect as much data as we can to understand what that mission experience looks like. I can tell you again, for us, you know, these are at least our perceived benefits. We don't have the data necessarily yet to show it, but it's very, I think, very obvious to us that it's been beneficial to have a clear and efficient treatment plan and, and recommendations. Um, I think there's been a pretty much across the board improvement in satisfaction. Our patients routinely will comment on how they, they feel more involved in the case. They feel better educated. Um, and even if it's a patient who very clearly needs surgery or should have surgery, and we come in as interventionalists because almost invariably the patient said, well, can you do stents? And of course, we're like, well, yeah, we can, but these are the reasons why we may not want to. And so what we find is that patients find that really valuable. They find it really valuable to know that they've been thought about on an individual level in a way that they can think about, you know, these are the, the, the paths and this is why it makes sense. And so we've seen a really, uh, from at least a perceived sense of greater level of satisfaction on the patient level, I think the, the referring physicians I talked to and even our, our, our surgeons, I feel like we've, we really find that with the improved and enhanced communication, everyone seems to be, uh, it feels like they're part of this team process that has really helped 
uh, I think improve everybody's satisfaction. And I think even us as interventionalists, you know, a lot of times, again, if their patients are coming to the cath lab and they are the most complicated, they are the sickest patients, similar to the one that Brett showed earlier, you know, it's easier for us to be able to plan those things ahead in advance. So that's really improved our level of satisfaction as well. And so as we think about moving beyond, again, the original syntax trial, we think about all the tools that we have in place. We think about how are we delivering the care and what we can do to deliver better care. We have to continue to think about you know, our patients, and we have to think about them differently. What is high? What is considered a high-risk anatomy versus the patient is high risk? And that may impact your decisions of how you're going to treat them uh, and what treatment path you're, you're going to go on. As we think about other current challenges, as we think about treating these more complicated patients, we have to think a little bit more about um, how do we treat them and what are the treatment disparities? How do we associate uh, how we train the, our, 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 ourselves how do we monitor our skills base and our development? Um, do we think about, you know, uh, how many, how do we deal with the fact that there are so many low volume operators that are out there? Over half of the, uh, the operators out there may do less than 50%, uh, 50 PCIs in a given year. And as we started talking about these complicated cases, you know, we know that with more practice comes better outcomes. I think that's pretty obvious and, and not something that was difficult to, to, to understand. The question then becomes, do we even have to create even more sub-subspecialty? Patient or, pay, or, or is this something that we can expect? Should we expect what, what is the minimum amount we should expect? Should we expect uh, everybody to do imaging? I would say yes, but do we think everybody will be facile at all the high risk complex uh, interventions and the, and the tools that we have available, that's probably a little bit unrealistic. But we have to think about how that, how, how do we deliver that care and how should that care be, be delivered to our patients? And so again, what does contemporary PCI look like? Well, it's gotta be evidence-based and, and that's something, again, continues to be a challenge in, in, in an ever-changing, rapidly changing world where you know technology is, is constantly evolving. And so we have to always re think about how do we use these tools, when and where and how, and is, are we getting the benefits that we think we're getting as the technology advances? And we become too self-reliant or too reliant on technology to overcome sometimes the shortcomings that we have as, as, as proceduralists. Do we need to take more time to do more imaging, to do more technique growing and, and, and really develop those techniques to, to give us uh, the technology really the best option to work. And so as we do that, we think about education, not just for our trainees that are going out in the world and are you know, going to be thinking about you know, how they're going to take the lessons they've learned here, but how do we, as we leave, or as, as we leave those training programs, how do we continue to keep those competencies? How do we change in an ever-changing world um, as, as the world today looks a lot different as it did when I left the training program? So as we think about it, in summary, you know, uh, we've certainly seen, you know, today we've talked a little bit about our journey over the last 10 years, been improved in clinical outcomes over the last decade. And it hasn't been just a real, solely on improved technology, but an emphasis on better techniques and better strategies for treatment of our patients. Um, as I mentioned in the last slide, you know, the, 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 you know, really the way forward is going to continue to be a constant evaluation and assessment of how and when to best apply the coming technology and the technological advances. And we have to better understand our patients and our patients' vulnerability. We have to continue to work on risk tools to better inform our patients and our, our referring uh, uh, physicians, you know, how we think the best way forward to treat these patients. And so as we think back, as we would try to wrap up, we think about the, the case that Brett showed us earlier, um, we gotta be able to show, you know, finish off that, uh, that, that, that presentation. And so the patient was ultimately deemed to be too high risk for surgery with his limitations in recovery and his ALS. And so here we have, Really contemporary PCI in, in one slide. We have an impella um, sitting there uh, to get, provide hemodynamic support. We have a temporary pacemaker wire just in case uh, things go awry. We have a rotational atherectomy to modify that calcium. We then do a, a lot of stenting and, and, and complicated bifurcation techniques and ultimately end with a happy, uh, uh, a happy individual who was ultimately able to be discharged home on guideline-directed medical therapy and continues to do well even a year out uh, from a car coronary and cardiac perspective. So I, I just want to end by saying thanks to, to all my colleagues. Like I said, it's been a journey for me, and, and I wouldn't be where I am if it wasn't for the support uh, of my colleagues. Um, 
we had a recent addition, Eric Canty is here. If you haven't had a chance to talk to him and meet him, he's fantastic. He's been a great addition. So um, really wanted to thank all our, our, our colleagues uh, that helped us along the way. Um, those of you who know me well know that I'm not a days and blue guy. I'm, you know, grown in Illinois, but, uh, you know, I had at least, at least have some respect for, for, for the institution. And I really wanted to thank, you know, it's, yeah, the team, right? So I really wanted to take time because this wasn't something that we've done on our own. And it has been obviously a lot of support from the other faculty, but also, you know, just everybody, and most of them who I see here now that have, you know, been there at those Friday, five o'clock at night, um, those painful nights with me uh, and with all of us. And so the techs, the nurses, APP, the trainees, everybody, um, really wanted to thank them all. And they're too numerous to name. So I didn't want to forget anyone. Just want to say thanks to everybody and all their support. So thank you. Um, anybody in the audience? Dr. Pinsky. First of all, I just want to convey my deep appreciation for the for the skill and thoughtfulness of the entire team. Um, last time I was on service, I, I actually watched like a groupie through the control window as an IVIS was performed, and there were just very thoughtful decisions. And I'm just I'm, I I deeply appreciate and admire the work that you all do. And then I have a question. So have you um, worked with engineering or has anybody uh, looking at AI or some way, you get so much data with the IVIS and the imaging, and then the decision is made by an operator how how wide the stent should be, how long it should be, whether you deploy one or two. Couldn't you somehow put something into a predictive algorithm where some maybe a computer will say, no, you need to put a second stent downstream or make it longer? Yeah, I mean, coming to a cath lab near you. I mean, I think that's, you know, AI is everywhere. And I think what you're going to see, and, and we didn't touch on really kind of the future, but, but you know, there's been a real um, focus on, on just not just FFR, you know, and physiologic data, but to be able to co-register that and, and really non-invasively attain that data and co-register such that you can get physiologic and IVIS data and imaging data all on one screen. And ultimately, the goal will be to get AI to be able to tell you this is how long you have to treat, this is the size you have to treat, this is what's going to, and, and, and be able to actually assess that in real time, not just with IVIS imaging again, but even post PCI physiology. So it's out there, people are working on it, it's coming. Yeah, it's coming. We have a question from Claire uh, from the virtual audience. Thanks, Victor. Um, Brett, Dan, I just wanted to thank you for an awesome presentation. Um, Dan, if you think that you feel old, um, imagine <laughs> how I feel. He, he just tries to make me feel old. <laughs> he's always that. He's always trying to make me feel that way. In the, as a as a stent minimalist, it's really awesome to see how far our field has come, and I appreciate your presentation very much. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Claire. Thanks for it. Um, I have a question for for both of you. I mean, we it, you you. Um, Kind of showed us a lot of information. You pointed on the on the clinical trial evidence for PCI versus cabbage. You talked about the fact that the the data for CTO is is not extremely robust in terms of clinical trials. I'm wondering how do you face patients in clinic when you have to talk about these complex procedures? I'm sure you talk a lot about the clinical benefits that may be available in can. Can, how do you put all that together with the clinical data plus what you think you can do for them? Yeah, that's that's really, you know, we've shown only the stuff that happens in the cath lab. But one of the things that's really nice is we have an infrastructure where we can meet with these people in clinic. And we have a 45 minute hour long discussion where we lay out in a way that they can understand what is the data, what kind of benefit can they expect, you know, oftentimes these patients are coming to our clinic have been told that they're about to drop dead by an outside facility. And so for all the patients that we treat, there's probably three of them that are walking around that we see in clinic about twice a year that we're medically managing, saying hi to that are completely stable with normal LV function and not having any angina and really no indication for PCI. So it's, it's really complicated. The landscape continues to change. But one of the joys about being here is that we kind of have the freedom to be completely honest with people. Everything is super informed, especially when we're doing, you know, something that might involve an advanced technique. And so that's, um, I think, the, one of the most gratifying things about doing what we do. 
All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks so much.